We are often advised to lift through a full range of motion to maximize muscle growth. However, is full range of motion lifting actually superior? And is there ever a time and place for partial range of motion? In this video, we will discuss these ideas and how they apply practically in our training routines. First, let's define what exactly range of motion means. In the simplest sense, range of motion refers to the degree of movement of the joint involved in the lift. This can literally be quantified by the degree of rotation of the joints using a goniometer. Obviously, more movement means a larger range of motion, while less movement means less range of motion. Range of motion is usually defined in relation to what is called full range of motion. This refers to the maximum movement capability of a joint during a specific exercise. However, this isn't actually a very strictly defined term because most lifts that we perform don't actually take the joint through their full range of motion. For example, is full range of motion for dips defined as this point here, or is it defined as this point here? As we can see, the picture on the right uses a larger range of motion for the shoulders and elbows compared with the picture on the left, although either of these examples could be considered full range of motion in a practical sense. However, most exercises have a fairly standard range that would be considered full range of motion. For example, full range of motion for a bench press is clearly defined as touching the chest in the bottom position and locking the elbows out in the top position. I don't want to get into unnecessary detail about what is considered full range of motion because it doesn't really have much practical application. For this video, we just need to understand that full range of motion is generally the standard we define other ranges of motion via. So when discussing partial range of motion training, this refers to a portion of the full range. For example, a partial range bicep curl would be a section of the full range, something like this. This could mean eliminating the top portion or the bottom portion, either would be considered partial range of motion. Furthermore, the specific portion of the partial range that we refer to has practical relevance, which is something we will touch on later in this video. So, what we really want to know is which is better for muscle growth, full or partial range of motion training. The best evidence we have on this topic is this meta-analysis, which compiled the evidence comparing full versus partial range of motion training on muscle growth. And as we can see in this forest plot, there was a significant benefit for full range of motion training on muscle growth compared with partial range. While the exact reasons for these findings are not entirely clear, emerging evidence suggests that it is likely due, at least in part, to the length that the muscle is trained at. In most cases, full range of motion training requires the muscle to stretch to a greater extent compared with partial range. Going back to our bicep curl example, full range training involves a greater stretch on the biceps compared with partial range. And this is the same for most, but not all exercises. This is important because research has found that training a muscle in a more stretched position tends to result in superior muscle growth compared with training a muscle in a shortened position. For example, this study compared hamstrings hypertrophy from the seated versus lying leg curl exercises. And as we can see in the black bars, the seated leg curl resulted in superior growth of all hamstrings muscles compared with the lying leg curl. This was likely the case since the hamstrings are in a more stretched position during the seated versus lying position. Going back to the range of motion discussion, this is one mechanism potentially explaining why we find superior muscle growth with full range training. If we train through a full range of motion, we usually train the muscle at a longer length and induce more muscle growth as a result. Another indirect benefit of full range of motion training is that it usually requires lighter loads compared with partial range. This is generally a good thing for health and longevity since lighter loads are less stressful on the joints and connective tissue. If we can get the same or greater muscle growth with a lower injury risk, this is definitely a positive in my eyes. This is another notable benefit in the range of motion discussion. However, it should be noted that full range of motion training isn't always safer than partial range. For some people during specific exercises, full range of motion training may cause greater joint irritation compared with partial range. This is something we will discuss in more detail shortly. So it is pretty clear so far that full range of motion training is more favorable than partial range. 
it results in superior muscle growth and a lower injury risk. For these reasons, I think full range of motion training should be the default technique to implement for hypertrophy training. However, are there any potential situations where partial range of motion may be beneficial? There are a few specific scenarios that I believe partial range training can have its place. Let's now cover what they are. The first is for specific exercises. Remember how we discussed that training a muscle at longer lengths tends to be superior for muscle growth compared with training at shorter lengths? Well, this has application for specific ranges of motion during specific exercises. There is some evidence suggesting that partial range of motion training at long muscle lengths could be equally as effective or even superior to full range of motion training in certain situations. This was found in this study, which compared the effects of leg extension training through different ranges of motion. One group performed partial reps in the bottom half of the lift, another group performed partials only in the top half, and the last group performed full range of motion. And as we can see, the full range group and the partial range in the bottom position both resulted in superior quad growth compared with the partials at the top position. And the partials in the bottom position seem to be even slightly superior to the full range group. This study suggests that for some exercises, it may be just as effective or even superior to perform partials when the muscle is in a lengthened position. However, it should be noted that this is probably only going to work in specific cases. For one, you need to perform partials in the lengthened position, and two, the lengthened position should be the hardest part of the range of motion. For example, this would work well with exercises like skull crushes or dumbbell flies, but I don't think it would be as favourable for exercises like cable flies or dumbbell curls. Another potential use of partial range of motion training is to be used as a finisher or an extended set in specific cases. This is because most exercises have a varying strength curve throughout the range of motion. This means that not all parts are equally as difficult, rather certain parts are harder and easier than others. This means that once we hit failure or our specific proximity to failure target using full range of motion training, we have only hit failure for the full range of motion. However, we may still have multiple reps left in the tank for a partial range. We can take advantage of this to implement metabolite techniques or extended sets for certain movements. A good example of this is for calf raises. Calf raises are easier in the bottom position and more difficult at the top position. So once we have exhausted the calves using full range of motion, we can continue the set by performing partials in the bottom half of the movement. However, this is only applicable for certain exercises. Furthermore, this is only really safe for machine-based isolation lifts, not for free weight compound lifts. So make sure to use this strategy in a safe and effective manner. And the last potential benefit of partial range of motion training is something we alluded to earlier, which is joint stress. While full range of motion training is usually going to be less stressful on the joints and connective tissue due to lighter loads being used, Partials may be beneficial for some people. Full range of motion during specific exercises for certain people may particularly irritate certain joints. This may only occur at certain portions of the movement, so partials may be a strategy to train around this issue. So to summarize this video, let's establish some practical recommendations. For the most part, full range of motion training is likely to be superior to partial range. A primary mechanism for this is probably because full range training stresses the muscle at longer lengths during most exercises. Furthermore, full range of motion training will usually be less stressful on the joints and connective tissue since lighter loads are used. However, partial range training may be a viable strategy to implement in some unique instances. It may be a useful option during specific exercises where the muscle is stressed at a long length and where the tension curve is most difficult. Partial range training can also be used in some metabolite style training methods as an extended set or as a finisher. And lastly, partial range training may be necessary for some individuals if full range of motion irritates the joints or connective tissue due to anatomical structure or injury history. So as a practical recommendation, full range of motion should be considered the default range to maximize muscle growth and partial range should only be used in specific situations where it makes sense to do so. 
Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.